The gap between Canada's rich and Canada's poor is closing a little. The new report from StatsCan says Canada's wealthiest, the top 1%, they make over about 250 grand, saw their share of the country's total income fall to a six-year low in 2012. StatsCan also found the total income portion of the bottom 99% grew for the first time since 1982. But some groups say the data is misleading. Earlier this year, the Broadbent Institute released a report that gauged wealth, not income. They found a deep and persistent wealth inequality exists in Canada. Is income equality inequality getting better in Canada? How do we compare to the U.S. as an example? And what needs to be done to close the gap? Joining me now from Toronto, former U.S. Secretary of Labor, a man who's written many, many books, Robert Reich, now a professor of public policy at the University of California at Berkeley. And also, he made a documentary called Inequality for All. Tonight, he is giving the keynote address at the Broadbent Institute uh, of Progress Gala on the topic of inequality. Good to see you, Mr. Reich. Well, uh, nice to see you, too, if I could see you, Evan, yeah. but it's very good to talk to you. In the U.S., low- and medium-income uh, earners are worse off than in Canada. The income share of the richest Americans grew from 18% in 2006 to 19.3% in 2012. In Canada, there's also real concerns about the disparity between the rich and poor. You've written extensively on this. Um, where is this heading? Is this the kind of issue uh, that is going to get worse and lead to social disruption? Well, I'm not sure it's going to lead to social disruption. I mean, uh, we all have the power in Canada, in the United States, in every country uh, to do something about it in terms of softening the blows, uh, expanding safety nets, investing in education. Uh, so we don't, you know, we're not simply passive recipients of this fate of widening inequality, but it's undoubtedly going to get worse if nothing is done because globalization and technological, technological changes are making the middle class and almost every industrial industrialized country uh, smaller, uh, more stressed, uh, making the poor, uh, well, enlarging the numbers of poor, and uh, actually creating huge wealth in the hands of very, very small numbers of people. I want to talk about, uh, th that's one element here, Mr. Reich, but the other element of creating jobs and how economies grow is immigration. It's a big issue here, much bigger issue. Here live in the United States. Tonight, the president will give a speech on immigration. We're expecting he will announce his plans to use his overriding executive powers to enact major changes to immigration policy. That's really the only power he's got right now. Will this, as Republicans have said, poison the well between president, the president and Congress? And what does he want to accomplish here? Uh, I don't think uh, it's nearly as big a deal as Republicans are making it. Uh, you know, every president has what's called enforcement discretion. Uh, discretion how to use enforcement resources. You can't possibly deport every undocumented worker or every undocumented person in the United States. Uh, there has to be some prioritization. Uh, and what the president is doing by this executive order is simply uh, making it official what the priorities are with regard to deportation policy. There is nothing special about this. Uh, I, when I was Secretary of Labor and had to enforce labor laws over nine million workplaces in America, I had to make priorities as well. We didn't have the enforcement resources. Uh, but Republicans are hell-bent on making this a major issue and convincing the American people that somehow uh, the president is uh, reversing laws that Congress has made. Uh, that is not the case at all. Tell me where you stand on, on the job creation. Obviously in the EU, places like that, creating jobs, every, everyone likes to say it. It's tough. Now there's two streams of thought here. One is, on one side, you've got Let's lower taxes, lower income taxes, lower personal taxes, lower consumer taxes, uh, lower corporate taxes. Lower taxes, that creates an environment where jobs come and people have more money to spend. That creates jobs. The other side says, nope, you've got to invest through programs like infrastructure and government programs to stimulate the economy. In your view, what is the best way to both create jobs and close the equality gap? 
Uh, well, Evan, you want to raise the minimum wage. You want to invest in education and job skills, obviously. Uh, you also want to make sure that people in the middle class and people who aspire to join the middle class have enough money so that they can turn around and spend. Because after all, the only reason businesses create new jobs is because they have customers. If they don't have customers, they're not going to create new jobs. And that's uh, that's really lies at the center of the problem in the United States and I dare say in Canada as well. Uh, the reason we have rather high unemployment, relatively high unemployment, is you don't have a growing middle class capable of continuing to buy enough uh, to stimulate job growth. All right. By the same token, you know, some people say statistics show the middle class is better off than it was 10 years ago, better off than it was 15 years ago. Some, some obviously this goes both ways, but what do you make of that? Well, I, we, we could spend the next couple of minutes in a very boring uh, uh, data analysis, but let me just tell you, the trend is clear. Uh, and anybody who tells you the trend is not clear really has not been looking very carefully at the data. Uh, and that is over the last 30 years, uh, the middle class median incomes in Canada, in the United States, have grown barely at all. I mean, if adjusted for inflation, they have almost been flat. Almost all the income gains, certainly in the United States, uh, to somewhat lesser extent in Canada, but Canada is following the same trend, almost all the income gains have gone to the very top. Now, I'm not accusing the top of anything nefarious, mm. uh, but what we see is that if you are well-educated and well-connected in this newly globalized and highly technological economy, uh, if government is not doing enough, uh, then inevitably uh, the money is going to go to the top. All right, Keystone. I got to talk about the Keystone XL pipeline. It's a massive issue in both countries. Recently, President Obama uh, has been playing down the job creation aspect of that pipeline in the U.S. Uh, he's delaying it. The Republicans have made this a very critical part of what they want to see. President Obama give the green light to this as a former Secretary of Labor. Um, what's your view on Keystone and what needs to happen there? Uh, well, Keystone is very, very clear if you do the costs and you do the benefits. Like on the cost side, uh, there are tremendous environmental hazards in terms of bringing uh, that uh, very dirty oil down to the Gulf for refining. Uh, on the positive side, well, there are some jobs, but the General Accounting Office in the United States, other studies have shown that the number of permanent jobs created by the Keystone XL pipeline is very tiny. And by one estimate, 92 new jobs. Uh, there are going to be some temporary jobs if it is built, but those are very fleeting and temporary jobs. So you just balance the environmental damage to the very, very few number of jobs, and you must come to the conclusion that it is just not worth it. So for you, you would be on these, don't do it. So the, the case that the refineries will refine the oil, that there's a security case that that oil is then used in North America. Uh, there's already 72 pipelines that go over the border. All that you say, and it's safer than rail. You would say to that, not enough. Well, not enough because, uh, look, at uh, where is the real growth in energy independence in North America? It is in uh, natural gas. It's in fracking. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a reason other than the particular business interests at stake uh, to go after uh, one of the most environmentally fragile areas in North America uh, that could create uh, some of the worst environmental problems for North America. And I'm talking about the, the tar sands. All right. Uh, you are... Your position on Keystone, very clear. Former U.S. Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich, now Professor of Public Policy at University of California at Berkeley, lecturing tonight on inequality. Thanks so much. Thanks, Evan.